Um, I'm in a good position of um, introducing Karen Kruka. Um, we've come a long way together as well, even further than this group of, of lovely people that I've met. Um, I just, when I read this um, a few days ago, I thought I'd have to share this um, for you. And one day she discovered that she was fierce and strong and full of fire and that not even she could hold herself. <laughs> uh, because her passion burned brighter than her fears. And that is exactly how I would remember Karen Krieger because this lady has worked in civil society, um, led a social enterprise um, network at the Gibbs University, uh, at the Gibbs Pretoria University, um, and she is now um, working with a team to to develop uh, the social economy white paper. I mean, this she's moved around. So um, welcome, and um, we we really look forward to it. Wow. Okay. Um, let's um, start. <laughs> to look like, 
What does their ecosystem need to be so that your social enterprises, your social innovators can thrive? And so for me, your work has allowed me to get to this point and has allowed us to start coloring in the dots. This journey has been extraordinary. When we talk the social economy, we're talking anything that's social plus economic. It's a messy world of non-profits, stock fails, of mutuals, of societies, of social enterprises, and there's a whole host of organizations there that we still don't even have labels for. I was chatting to a funeral director the other day who runs a funeral society, and he said, where do I fit? And right now I don't know where he fits, but I know he fits. So today I want to share with you some of what I found is working in this space. And the first is the spectrum. I love the spectrum. I know our world is not a straight line. And I appreciate that nothing that we do has an A to a B. But when you want to describe these concepts of profit and purpose, and how the world of the social economy bridges, and where the space sits for social enterprises within that, the spectrum is a fantastic tool. And I have yet to find something that so well conceptually describes our world. It also works when you want to describe why it is so important to open up the middle of the spectrum. Because our economies are so dependent on for-profit and not-for-profit companies in our understanding of who does social change and who does economic growth. And that if you actually open up the middle, you've got a space to work. It's also a very valuable tool to start transforming the conversation around funding. A lot of our social change still talks about success in terms of how much money. I don't have enough money. And when we look at the spectrum, we're able to start opening the conversation around it's not about the amount of money, but the type of money that you can bring into your organization that brings sustainability. Fantastic entry point into social enterprise, earned income, and sustainability. Lastly, the spectrum works very well to describe why we don't have a definition. Because organizations plot differently across the spectrum, they move across the spectrum in response to context. And so it's the perfect way to explain why we still, after all these years, can't say exactly in one sentence what it is that we do. My second bit of insight is around the role of context. I've opened many talks on social entrepreneurship on the why. And it's very easy to talk about the why because academically we also know social enterprises respond to market failure. So we start with the why. And the why has got a, it's got a bite to it. It's inequality. It's unemployment. It's Johnny Miller's pictures on the cover of Time magazine. It's that awful figure of in 2014, South Africans have the same quality of life as citizens in Syria. It's where are we now? And it's the negative. And it took a conversation with the Social Enterprise Academy, with Neil and Rachel, that really shifted my thinking. Because we were talking about the experience in Scotland of developing their social enterprise policy. And the question was, not where are we now, but where to? It seems very simple. But what is the vision? The generational vision. And now we start every policy session with the where to. Not the present, not where are we now, but where do we want to go? What is your vision for South Africa in 2050? One generation being 30 years. I can tell you that in 2050, South Africa is a country where there is no crime, where education is fantastic, and where there's opportunity for all. South Africa is a country of extraordinary environment, of a, of a clean environment with no waste. We're a, we're a country that has a thriving community economy that has dramatically lessened its reliance on imports. We are a country that is credit free, as a credit free society. And we are a country that a long time before 2050 actually rolled into town, we had internet access in all of our towns, our villages and our cities. It shifts the conversation when you ask where do we want to go rather than where are we now and what are we responding to. So a great thank you to the Social Enterprise Academy
for shifting the whole conversation out of the negative. My third point is, what are we learning about the social economy? So we're gathering data as we go. I have to, this is a room of academics, so I have to be up to date about this. This is not formally analyzed yet. We haven't captured all the data. What I've got here is responses from about 140 people across three provinces. East and Cape, from Popo, Northwest. And it's not analyzed. It's literally captured in Excel spreadsheets. But it's really interesting. Because the first thing is, is that what we see in terms of our, particip our participants, and we're averaging about 40 people per session, is that there's a real mix of ages, but there is definitely an older age group that's kicking in. But it's not quite correlating to experience. And the assumption would be that age equals experience. So what I think we're starting to see here is that is the openness of the social economy, that people come into it at different phases of life. And we can't, we, you know, we can't take that assumption that old people equals cooperative. This is very interesting, and we will, we will start looking at the data a little bit more intensely, but this 37% this of people with one to five years experience shows the enormous potential of the social economy, and that people continue to be attracted to it. The second is that there's a higher degree of formalization in the social economy than I expected. A majority, we're looking at about 90% about of the people that we're working with have bank accounts for their organizations. That shows us an, a formal connectivity into the system. But it's not translating into a need for legal support. And when we start looking and understanding this, I think we're going to find that it's because engaging the system doesn't need to happen at that technical level. Because the system is operating on trust. And we ask a number of questions around trust. These are just two. How important is trust to the success of your organization? And does the community trust your organization? It's starting to show us that trust is the glue that holds the social economy together. Which makes our role quite interesting. Because our role then is how do we support this growth of trust? How do we build legitimacy in the trust-making system? And from a policymaker's perspective, that's not necessarily about creating legal compliance frameworks. Very, very interesting. My fourth point is that I still have questions. It's very easy to work in a space of good. But I am very guarded about good. Because your good may not be my good. And I feel that often we don't interrogate enough the work that we do. And as much as we're colouring in the picture, we at times need to step back and say, are we colouring the picture with the right colours? This is a picture of a water cellar. This is taken in Kimberley. But in my travels, Cape Town, I'm very sorry, the drought finished here, but it hasn't finished anywhere else. And I'm from Port Elizabeth. <laughs> I don't think you feel a bit sensitive about this. But it's not just drought. There's a failure at the municipality level to provide drinkable water to citizens. And this is an ongoing problem that we've been seeing as we travel. But what an incredible opportunity for social enterprises. This is the world of the social enterprise. It's the market failure that the social entrepreneur spots the gap, they step into the gap, they start providing the service, they charge a rate that is affordable to, to the community, and you have a thriving social entrepreneurship business. It's textbook stuff. But I have a problem. Because water is a human right. Access to water is a basic human right. And what are we doing about commoditizing access to a basic human right? Is it ethical for us to be charging people for water? and creating a relationship with water that is then linked to affordability. Are we also not skirting a line here where we relegating our responsibility by not holding government to account to meet its constitutional obligation to provide it? I don't have answers, but I also don't think we should shirk our responsibility to ask your questions. I also have a bugbear too, which I thought I would raise, 
which is around scaling. I hear a lot about how success in social innovation and social enterprises around growth. And I would like to ask that we check this. Because our ecosystem is fragile. And growth isn't what we want in my mind. We really want to focus on building stability in organizations so that they can be sustainable. And stability comes through predictability. And predictability does not come with scale. So those are my two, my two areas of caution at the moment. The question marks. But this is where your work is so important. Because if we didn't carry in the dots, we wouldn't be able to understand the details. And we wouldn't be able to ask ourselves some difficult questions and figure out the next steps. And my last point for you today is around collaboration. We are a collaborative economy and your project epitomizes this. But the social economy does tend to work in some binaries. Cooperatives versus social enterprises. For profits versus non-profits. We draw lines between urban versus rural. We mustn't fall into the competitive economy mm -hmm. trap, which is an us and them thinking. Mm -hmm. Our economy is a collaborative one, and it is perfectly epitomized by your project and your work, which brings <coughs> people together, connects the dots with each other, and looks at where to, where do we go next. Mm -hmm. We must continue to focus on this collaboration. And as much as I appreciate that this is the meeting that kicks off the last meeting of, of the project, it's not. From my perspective, this is the start point of your work. Because the collaborations are here. And the power of your project is that you cannot have collaboration unless you've got somebody to collaborate with. Unless you've got people to connect to. And if you've got a spider network across a country that, de that delves outside of the urban areas and outside of the mainstream. And that is the power of your work. That is very much the power of the Common Good First Project. I would like to thank you for taking, I imagine, some very messy steps in the beginning. That probably didn't make any sense. That there was an EU log frame that looked great on paper, and then when you had to translate it into practice, was like, what on earth? <laughs> Did they write in the proposal document? <laughs> right? And that's the reality is that what you can write and what it translates into are different. That's the power of our space, is our flexibility, our ability to step into context, our ability to adapt, and our ability to innovate. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you to the universities who continue to play such a powerful role in connecting our society. And thank you for making sure that this project carries on. And thank you for making sure that the question isn't what is social entrepreneurship or what is the social economy. Thank you for making sure that the question stays future focused. And for making sure that we keep asking that question of where will we be in 2020. Enjoy the rest of the time.